New York and on the new Hot 97 app. Ebro in the morning. On Hot 97. Ebro, Laura, Rosenberg. Give it up for the bro Jeremy on the program. Slave play on Broadway. Jeremy Wait, Harris. Jeremy That sounds Harris. crazy to say on the radio. Slave, Slave play? play? Slave play on Broadway. Come check it out. Well, we've been feeling the same way about <laughs> talking about it. Um, so is it? it's on Broadway now. Mm-hmm. And I read an article recently. Um, first of all, uh, congratulations. Thank because you. Because you've been building this for how many years? Uh, I mean, actually, it's like it sounds less impressive when I say it. Like two and a half years. This play, this yeah, specific this play. Specific yeah, play. yeah, yeah. I wrote, I finished writing it at the end of my first year of grad school, and I just graduated. And grad school is three years. And you're thirty. I just turned thirty. Yeah. Wow, amazing. Yeah. And you're on Broadway now. I'm on Broadway. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, this is a big deal, uh, according to an article I read, because you're somehow uh, the savior of the correct queer, us. The, uh, I black know, queer no, Broadway. Oh, God. I hate that. No, okay, so I, a very kind person wrote that, Mikkel Street, but it actually was one of those things where it's like, he didn't write the headline, and I didn't, I didn't never said that, and <laughs> it was the kind of thing, it came out before my play came out. Uh, last November, and it was like Jeremy O'Harris, the black queer savior of the American theater. And I was like, uh, what? Like, <laughs> yeah, um, that's a lot. I'm that's not, a lot. Uh, yeah, I'm not your black Jesus or your gay Jesus or whatever. <laughs> or black and gay Jesus. Yeah, I don't want to be either of those things. I kind of just want to like write plays. This was my second play I ever wrote. So it's kind of psycho. It's like, it's like you, I, I, I keep, I have a lot of friends that are musicians. So I'm always like, it's like I wrote an indie album that accidentally went pop and like, you don't want to just be like, like, oh, you that pop nigga. It's like, no, I'm not. I'm like, actually, like, I wanted to be downtown with all the freaks. Right. Uh, so how did it happen then? How did you end up this quickly, this thing ending up on Broadway? I mean, I think it's a lot of things. I think that, like, first of all, I, I didn't, I lived in L.A. for six years as an assistant. I was, like, an assistant for a lot of important people in L.A. And uh, a lot of my friends are, like, musicians and a lot of people who, like, just liked my vibe. You know, I was, like, that guy that, like, would be, like, there'd be, like, I was, I was, I was, I was I thought I would write a memoir called, like, Plus One because I was always some Popping famous. person's Plus One. Yeah, and, like, and it's just because, like, I would be a good conversation piece and, like, a lot of people who are, and I'm realizing this now myself, like if you're being asked to like be the center of attention, it's really nice to have someone who can offset that attention really easy. And I was always there to be like, hey, like, have you read this book? Have you done this thing? So that everyone at the party would be like, who are you? So anyway, I did all that. And then finally all my friends were like, yo, like you need to figure your life out. Like you're like 26 now. And like, we all thought it would like happen. And like, it still hasn't. Like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to write plays. And like, so do that. So then I went to this thing called the McDowell Colony, which is like this, the oldest artistic residency in the country. And I wrote my first play there. And then after that, I got into Yale because someone there was like, you should apply to Yale. Um, I never finished undergrad. Um, and Yale was one of the three playwriting programs in the country you can go to without an undergraduate degree for grad really? school. Okay. Yeah, it's wild. Um, and I went there because I was ostensibly like I couldn't pay my rent and write at the same time. So uh, I wanted to go to Yale because they pay you to go there. So I went to Yale, uh, got paid to write, and I was like, I'm going to write something insane, something that will never be produced. Because the play I wrote to get into Yale was a play I thought everyone would produce. And ICM signed me from it. I got into Yale from it. I got a, all this cool shit from it. But everyone I sat down with to produce it was like, no, nigga, you have a pool on stage. Like, what are you talking about? Wait, what, what was, was that, that play? Yeah, what was yeah. that play about? That play's called Daddy. <laughs> and it's uh, basically, it's a melodrama about an interracial, intergenerational uh, relationship between a 25-year-old art collector, or a 25-year-old artist and a 60-year-old white art collector. And then, like, the sort of collision that happens when the art, the art maker's mother comes from the South and is like, I'm going to save my son's soul, not because he's gay, but because this rich white man is trying to, like, destroy his spirit. Um, and it's, like, this really crazy, weird, funny play that, like, George Michael's father figure is in and... Yeah, and um, so no one wanted to do that play because they were like, it takes place around an infinity pool in Malibu. And so if you wanted to do that play, you had to pay for a pool, which I found out when we did do it, cost a shit ton of money and yeah. is actually not fun for actors. Like, right, right, right. right. <laughs> like, you know, you walk around, you get actors who get, like, rosacea and shit because they've oh, been in the no. water for, you know, days and days and days. But, uh, yeah. But so, the concept was captivating. The, ca the concept was major. And so yeah. everyone was like, this dude can write. And, like, I wrote a 19th century melodrama with black people people in it and everyone was like Pfft. so um you could i wish you guys had done the sound i really want the sound the radio sound the oh the bomb the, yeah the oh, one that, Nick, yeah nikki has it all the time so. yeah i got you here i'm gonna take care of you there you go say the last thing you just said again um, you know and everyone was like 
Wait, hold on. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Okay, so it up. I wrote a 19th century melodrama with black people in it, and everybody was like, it's, what, what's the, <laughs> right, hold on, hold on, we're gonna get it right. Okay, I wrote a 19th century melodrama with black people in it, and everybody was like, right. what the hell's going on, man? But you. Where is Nikki's person? No, 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 don't, Nikki's person, this is the real one. This is the Funk Master Flex from the actual, this is the one. Everyone, every other one is an imitation. Wait, if we try get it this again, right, try it again. Okay, we're gonna get this right this time. Last and I'm gonna time. film it. Oh, here we go. Okay, you sure? I wrote a 19th century melodrama with black people in it, and everybody read it and was like, Oh! Yeah. oh. oh. There you go. We there did you it. Go. We did it. <laughs> so, okay, so, so, so I'm guessing also the timing of everyone now wanting to um, tell stories that have never been told before has also benefited the movement of slave play. Yeah. Like you have I a mean, lot of people who are like, well, let's let's hear different voices for the first time ever in history. Complete I mean, the place that produced the play was a place called New York Theater Workshop, which is major. But they're like the hub of like experimental theater in New York. Like mm. it's like if you want it's like I mean, I'm trying to think of like the best like music. I mean, even by the name New York Experimental yeah, Theater, right, they're right, leading right. into the workshop. fact that they want to do things different. Yeah, and like people like Ivo Van Hova, who's like the European dude who comes here, and like anytime he does a classic play, he's like, "Let me just fuck it up." Like he's doing West Side Story this year. Yeah, it's and he's like doing the like he gets. It's the first time Jerome Robbins' his choreography isn't going to be in it, which I know people are like, "What?" But it's like all that like the sort of the ballet and stuff you saw. That's not going to be there. It's a Black West Side Story, right? It, the lead is a black dude named Isaac Cole Powell, which is, like, insane. And also all the, like, Latinos are played by, like, East Asia. It's going to be, like, major. I, I don't know. No, what, it's supposed to be phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. So it's, like, that's that they, they started that dude's career in America. And so when they wanted to do me, I was like, oh, wow, I'm in that lineage. But also... I, there's been like four black playwrights they've done, like you know, in two decades. Right. But like, and part of that is because, like, you know, most of these places didn't have infrastructures that actually could like put black voices in the forefront. Because also, I think a lot of these theaters were kind of like we'll just stay in our lane because like we are the East Village like crew of white theater makers doing this. And I think that like in the last like decade or two, they've been like, oh no, we have a different responsibility. So, um, black. Black actors on stage, black stories being covered, black characters being covered, uh, black writers. Yeah. Not new to Broadway, yes. right? It's it's happened, but not at the frequency we know it should have. Yes. Uh, before we get to the actual dynamics of slave play on Broadway, why is what's happening with you different than anything's ever happened before? I mean, I think it's because my politic has has in, has been able has been absorbed by the producers of my play. Not to mention the fact that like I am a producer on my play, which is like definitely something that's never happened Got before. It. It's like a really um I think I mean I I've, I've seen people tweeting about it and I haven't really talked about it, but I mean I'm working with a group of like producers, one of whom is Troy Carter, who's a black man, yep. and um, a, like four white allies in like the lead pr producer position, who were like, you know what, like let's do this actually. And Troy Carter was involved in Lady Gaga mm -hmm. as yes. a manager, I, yeah, think, he, I believe. He was her also, manager. Spotify. He yes. was an executive there for a long time, so yeah, he's he's been moving around the industry yeah. and doing some amazing things for a while. And he's the big one of the biggest black art collectors in the country, which wow. is how I found out about him wow. because Rasheed Johnson, who I don't know if you know his work, but he made Native Son on Broadway. I'm not I mean on HBO this year. He saw the play like in its third preview and was like, yo, let's go talk. And Rashid and I are like literally the same person in like different fields. And I was, he was like, you know, this play is obviously gonna move. And people were whispering about it then. But I was like, yo, I don't know that I can have my play move if I don't have a black producer because I don't know what that would mean. Like, what what would it mean to go to Broadway with a play called Slave Play mm -hmm. with all white producers, you know? Right. And he was like, Well, you should call Troy. And I was like, Troy's never done a play before. He's like, you should call Troy. And so I did. Mm. And it changed everything. You know what now I mean? When you, we say, when, when we say producer in Broadway terms, it's di obviously much different than in music terms and even different somewhat than in film terms. Does that mean Troy digging into his pockets himself to put up money to push this play? Yeah, I think like like 1.5 million or something. So it's Not a, to put his business on the But street, it's a real it's investment. Some, it's a real investment. Right. It's like a real investment. I mean, each of the major producers on the play had to put in like a third of the uh, of the budget. And our budget is three point nine million, which is crazy. And that includes. Sorry, Laura. Go ahead. It's okay. No, at any point, did you ever get any pushback or anybody being like, oh, "I don't know if you should call it slave play"? Or mm, at Yale, 
Yeah, I mean, I had two teachers quit my play at Yale, and the only reason I kept doing, and they told me I had to change part of the play. Why? Um, because they, like, well, first of all, I think it, now looking back on it, I think a lot of it was about power and about, because I was, I was, because I had been an assistant to major screenwriters in LA, I knew that the way notes work is that people give you notes and you're like, you listen to them, you take them in. And if they don't work for you, you say, thank you so much for your note. I'm going to keep doing this. And then we'll come back later. And a note is a critique or a change or a note is a change. Yeah. Like you should do this. You should do that. And like you process and you're like, okay, cool. Like, let me keep doing my work and then I'll come back to you. And if it still doesn't work, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, I'll change it because for me, a good note is about something that you were trying to articulate that is not being, it's getting mumbled or jumbled by the time it gets you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, when I did finally decide to take a teacher's note after they yelled at me and like went in fully berserk about me not taking their note, I was, I changed the play and I went back to the black lead actress of my play and I was like, so I changed the ending, like this is the ending now. And she was like, why did you change this? And this actress is named Antoinette Crow Legacy. She is on. Uh, uh, Godfather of Harlem right now. She's one of the best yeah, actors. Yeah, it's about I've to ever. come out. Yeah, we just talked about that. Yeah, yeah that. she's she would have been in it at New York City Workshop had she not booked this TV show. But anyway, because I, I for me it's like fam first all the time. Like I always get whatever. Anyway, this woman saved my play because she looked me in the face. She was like, "No, what what the reason the character does this at the end of the play is because." And then she spoke words that I'd never said to anyone else in like anywhere else in part of the process, anywhere else in my life, that were the deepest, darkest things that were inside of my spirit. And she was like, this is what Kanisha's going through. So don't change a word. And when I came back to the professors and I was like, I'm not changing it, they were like, well, you know what? We're off the project. Take our names off. And the only reason I knew I was doing something great or interesting or worthy of other eyes was because every other student of color at the school, specifically the black women who were in my year, like, and Amon Lajahava, who's about to be on the Showtime series, uh, How to Sleep with a Black Woman or something like that, um, uh, Moses Ingram, Connecticut, uh, too. they sat around me and they were like, you are doing the work. And I was like, oh, fuck. And I was like, maybe it's a generational thing. Yeah. Maybe the people mm. from this level don't get it, but the people on this level do. So for me, it's always been, how can I make sure people at my level, in my bracket, will come to the play first? And then dictate the terms of engagement for everyone else so they know what the fuck now, they're watching. Can you tell us, give us more insight into what made this so controversial? Like the the, the what she's going through and why they wanted to change. I mean, the play is about sex, you right. know? The play is about like the like the play, the title in and of itself is a litmus test for if you want to come. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, I feel like some people are like, How dare he write this play? Like, I would never see that. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's the reason it's the title. If the title scares you already, then you this isn't a play for you. If the word slave play or if the, if the two words slave and play put together like frighten you then you have the litmus tests worked mm -hmm. we now know that it's not a play that you want to engage with because for me slave play the type being the title is the best title ever because it's a fact it's a fact of a series of plays there's been a lot of different plays about slavery in the same way there's been a lot of different movies about slavery and when you go to twitter facebook tumblr and people talk about these things they're like oh i don't want to see another slave movie i don't want to see another slave play and i was like great if they don't want to see another slave play they should I don't need to call this like Hot 97 and then they show up and it's a slave play. You know, I'm going to call it slave it play so you know what the is. fuck you're going right. to. Also, slave play is something, it's an act. It's a kink. It's a kink that exists on the internet and it's a kink that people have talked about jokingly on the internet for years. Like, I was reading about slave play on Tumblr like a decade ago. And it's something that both Daddy and Slave Play were active titles to disrupt. I was like, how can I have something that will be like a viral title that could maybe disrupt a hashtag? Like, how can I like like clout chase a hashtag and like right, and then take right. it over. Smart. And I did. Like if you look if you looked up hashtag slave play a month ago, you might have seen something from the off Broadway stuff, but you would have definitely seen a lot of people like in, in like full bondage getting right. fucked. And right. now what you see are people leaving the theater like, love this play, or like, what the fuck was that? Or like change forever. But they're talking about a black person. They're talking about something a black person wrote in black thought, and that's different than what they were thinking about. A, like three months ago and what is what for you let's talk about power dynamics right because i'm sure that's in the film and why is it purposeful the play, not play. The film, i mean the, the play sorry God, e bro. i'm sorry, on, man. <laughs> sorry i'm sorry, Get your bro uh, away, you bro. I'm sorry man i'm sorry <laughs> um having that title and what you're covering bringing it up in 2019 2020 there's a power oh. dynamic that exists because of slavery yeah. Right. Even the fact that when you look up the hashtag, it was 
related to sex and not actually dealing with the reality of what this nation was built on. 100%. And the thing that for me, I, I mean, it was so funny. I started to realize that every actress that's ever killed it in their audition for Slave Play, and we've had three different actresses play this role, Antoinette, Tiana, and now Jakina Kalakunga, who you guys have to see because she's amazing. Um, and we have an understudy, Ebony Flowers. So all four of these women are all women who just so happen to be from the South. I am also from the South. And when you're from the South, the fact of chattel slavery being something that has affected every part of your life is unavoidable. I drove by a plantation every day to get to school. Mm. Every day when I lived in Martinsville. I had my high school graduation at the Hamlet Plantation, which was a plantation that one of my friends, I mean, he wasn't my friend, I actually hated Hamilton, uh, f whatever, whatever, I, whatever. Someone you knew. <laughs> someone I knew. I just, I can't believe I just called this person I went to school with who was the, like, bane of my existence, my friend. But you know what? That's what happens. That's, that's 30, right? right. You know, that's, <laughs> right. that's gross. <laughs> Um, right, that anyway, is great. Um, anyway uh, we, we had our graduation party on his plantation. I had my first beer on a plantation because we were playing beer pong, and I had always been like the good kid, and I drank beer at that plantation. So, Wait, for, and when you say on his plantation, like his, his family's family plantation owned. that they've owned for— Since slavery. I guess. I mean, like, they renovated these small houses there— into guest houses. Yeah, so those were definitely yeah. slave quarters. Yeah. Yep, yep. yeah, and that's where everyone hung out. And, and you guys hang out there, right. So yeah. it's, part, so it's built into your socialism. It's, it's built, built into everything. It's, and it's built into my psyche. Right. And I think that, like, you know, something that this play is looking at is how is it that when a white person microaggresses, like, why does it become such a big deal inside of our bodies? Do, is there some psychic thing that's taking us back, not just to, like, the civil rights era, but to, like, 1845 pre-emancipation proclamation and are we having a moment where this white person is saying I own you when they touch your hair this way or is there or and or when someone's saying I love you and you're looking at them and remembering that they had been they had slighted some black woman or some black man on the street and you're their partner are you remembering that you were that kept you possibly are that kept person inside of their like plantation that they've brought inside of the house and do you feel you know what I mean and even I as a black kid who's only been and, and like the like I went to Yale right that's a fact of my fucking life I am the house nigga of all house niggas in certain a certain conception of like blackness no matter where I came I literally grew up in a single mother home in Martinsville Virginia and like she pushed me into a private school and I felt like I was kidnapped by white supremacy at like five years old and like that is a relation and she did that to save me right you know like Toni Morrison just died you know I think of Setha all the time in Beloved and the sacrifices she made with her child's life right. and her children's psyche in order to give them a better life. So I I see those relationalities. But it in, haunted her, though. It haunted it her. Ha it did. And I think that a lot of the things about the way I had to grow up haunted me, and so I had to put them in plays. And those plays are about this entanglement with white supremacy that mm -hmm. you can't get in and out of. You know, even being on Broadway right now, I told my producers that after we had our second to last, we had our last meeting, I was fully, I had just done two off-Broadway plays, was doing my thesis at Yale, which is a thesis play about how much I fucking hated being at Yale for three years, and how being at Yale made me feel like, because uh, like, I think in metaphor, I always think in metaphor, it's not a simile for me, it's always a metaphor, and when I was at Yale, I felt like we, they told us all the time that we were the most diverse class they'd ever had. The most diverse class, most diverse class, most diverse class. And I was like, oh, are, is this like Little Rock, Arkansas? Like, are we like the the the, the black kids that are finally just dragging into this like segregated environment mm -hmm. and are celebrated their integration as views for once? And again, a lot of very nice people went into making this stuff. A lot of very nice people got hired and a lot, and I got a lot out of it, right? I got to get the kind of education I wouldn't have gotten at any other graduate school because I, I couldn't have gotten into them because I didn't have an undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. um, but... Like, I, um, fuck, I'm losing my train of thought because it's like, there's so many thoughts. Um, <laughs> but you, were, so, you were talking about, you were talking about the haunting and, the, yes. and being kidnapped in the white supremacy and, and, and then, how that and related to everything in your educational life and being pushed into that because of your single mom trying to save your life, which in some regards, because she's trying to save you in America, you get pushed into these arenas that also traumatize you. Yes. In and a I different talking, way than you would have been traumatized if she didn't push you. Right. Exactly. And I brought up my thesis show because I was working on my thesis as I was meeting with the, the Schuberts who own the Broadway theaters. And this is something that people don't know about Broadway theaters. If you don't impress one of the three uh, theater owners, landlords, 
you don't get a theater. Like you could have the coolest play ever, the most like watched wow. play ever, but if they don't want to hang out with you, you just don't get in, right? Wow. Or they don't like your producer. It's like it's like a really complicated and not actually That's complicated. the politics of yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's actually it's, simple. It's actually really simple. It's actually really old school, you know? And in some ways I kind of like that because it, you can be someone who's like who every other producer in town is like I don't fuck with you. You can have a 27-year-old lead producer who is a 27-year-old from Connecticut and also a college dropout and you can sit in front of two people People at the Schubert's who have, who are in their late 60s and be like, hey, this is our play. This is how we're going to do it. This is why it's major. Did you read the New York Times? Also, here's our playwright. And I can go and do, do all the things. And if they love it, And if they love on. it, it's on. And I did that, and we had our last meeting, and it was draining. I had had the craziest year of my fucking life. And I looked at Greg, and I was like, Greg, this has been a lot of fun, but I never wanted to be on Broadway. I never thought I'd be on Broadway. And honestly, we could get Rihanna to come to the King's Theater in fucking Brooklyn, and it would change the world in a bigger way than us doing it on Broadway, because at least at the King's Theater, I can charge everyone $13 a head and run it for years, and that would actually be a bigger story. Mm -hmm. But then Broadway called and said, hey, you have a theater, and I didn't tell everyone no. I said yes, because a part one of the complicated things about white supremacy is that access is... And power is something that could actually be a major game changer, too. You know, it's the same reason why it will be easy for someone like Kirby at Pierre Moss to be like, I don't want Vogue to ever write about this. I want Essence to have the, like, main... That's right. Like, Kirby took his shit to Brooklyn, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, yep. Kirby took it to Brooklyn, but he also let Vogue write about it. That's right. You know what I mean? And I think that's one of the things that we have to... That, like, we are always navigating as black bodies is, like, that relationship to the white supremacy slash the master. And that's what this play is actually about. Like, it's about all of those power dynamics. It's like, on its surface, it seems to be about, you know, one very specific thing. But the more you sit with it, the more... It, I mean, I talked to... I mean, this this sounds so fucking bougie, and I'm sorry Do to, it. like, name drop. Do it. But um, I wrote a movie called Zola, and Taylor Page is in it, and Taylor Page now dates Jesse Williams. So that's the way I can talk about Jesse Williams telling me a story. Um, Jesse Williams last Wait, was night. Was Zola off that Twitter, that yeah. Twitter thread? Okay, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Me and oh, you leaned into that. You yeah. got me and Janixa wrote yeah. that. You, man. Janixa Bravo is the director and the co-writer. She's a genius. Check her out. That should be another like... But it's oh, not. Wait, hold on. Wait, hold on. Get it right. Get it. Okay, here we go. Here we go. It might take a couple tries. Yeah, okay. I love I love the explosions. <laughs> I just want to be an explosion. Um, Janixa Bravo is the co-writer and director, and you guys are going to flip the fuck out when you see it. Ah! <laughs> to freedom! <laughs> so when does Zola? When is Zola? I can't say. Okay. Wait, cool. and what's the Jesse Williams okay, story? Okay, okay. So Jesse Williams told me that after he saw the play the first time, all he and Taylor did, they walked, they walked from the theater to the hotel and talked about it from the the entire way there. They talked about it, talked about it, talked about it, and didn't stop talking about it for three weeks. Three weeks this place sat with them. How many times have you seen a fucking movie and it just sits with you for a minute? And wow. then you were immediately like, where am I going to go? Can we go to Red Lobster or are we going to Applebee's? <laughs> right, right, like, right. are we going to, you know, or like, you know, it's New York. So those things like don't exist outside of Times Square. Right. But you know what I mean? Yes. And like that, that to me is why I wrote a play. Because there aren't enough plays by black people that get produced. I'm not saying they don't exist because they do exist. I can name the writers right they now. Get made. Alicia Harris, Jackie yeah. Silvis Jury, Jordan Cooper, Donye Love. Tori Sampson, fucking Josh Wilder. They're writing these plays for us that where we can think we'll Here comes the, the DM. Theater. Damn, but, you named all the black ones. You didn't name me? Oh, uh, no. Oh, the, I'm going to get that already. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, my king. All right, there you go. Um, my actual getting, king. Okay, so how are we getting black and brown faces in the audience? I don't know, I'm but I did something up. last night. Well, you was going to say really last cool. night? Tell us about what you did yeah, last night. Also, this is going to sound so... I mean, I feel like everyone's going to... This is going to come out like, wow, because like, already the Hoteps are like... They're like, wow. His PR team is really fucking with us. I'm like, hey, Guys, my PR team is me. I mean, there are PR people, obviously, because some things got set up. But, like, the ideas that they're, like, responding to, I came up with. Like, I was, like, with Kalella, I was, like, yo, like, Kalella and I had this interview. Kalella was, like, the next time I see this play, I want to see it with only black people in the audience. And I was, like, okay, cool, bet. We'll do it. Not thinking I was going to Broadway. I get this Broadway house, and the producer's, like, so we're doing all this stuff. And I'm, like, wait, 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 guys, 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 guys. We need to have one night. Uh, where the theater's just black people. Thanks. And everyone was like, wait, how? And I was like, I mean, that's the far that's the far as I got on it. But like we could and so we we literally bought out the theater for one night, subsidized the tickets so that tickets could be forty five dollars or a hundred dollars. And we are we got 
800 black people in the theater last night. 800 that. fucking black people. And I saw the hoteps fucking shaking on Twitter because they were like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. See, this is exactly what they were going to do. Put a bunch of black people in the audience. That way, that, that way all these blue check black people will say that, like, it was great. And it'll trick all the lesser black people who aren't black checks to, or Man, blue checks to go see. Them, and I was like, this is psychotic. Like, I can't win. You'll, you'll one minute, I know, I'm one minute the play is only for white people and it won't ever work with black people in the audience. Next minute, I feel the audience with black people. They're like, oh, the only reason they all liked it is because they're the Wakanda world, black. That's, no, that yeah. is, yeah. That is Twitter in a nutshell. It was wild. It was wild. And the only but, reason I brought it up, because I remember I got a chance to see Hamilton. It was me, Shawnee, and the only other black woman in the audience was Lauren Hill. Are you serious? Me, Shawnee, were looking at each other. We looked at around. I'm like, wow, there's not one Latino or black person in here. And he was like, wait, there's one. I'm like, and it's Lauren Hill. Yeah. And that's it. It was just us three. And the thing well, is, oftentimes, I, oftentimes, we oftentimes, felt crazy. Either, uh, oftentimes it's pricing, yeah. right? And it's also knowledge uh, and understanding of watching a play. Versus watching a TV show, versus yeah. watching a movie, understanding how to wrap your brain around what you're seeing. A lot of times they can't eat, like people who've never been to plays or been exposed to theater, they get in there and they just, there's a disconnect. Yeah. It's, it's different. It's culture. It is a different experience. And particularly with musicals, musicals culturally have been, for the most part, so white in so many ways. Like literally you hear the music and you're like... You know, so if I'm around white people, and like the, uh, growing up, my parents would occasionally play show tunes for a, a, a musical they liked, and there were some I liked, and there's some that I was like, "Whoa, guys, this is." <laughs> but the I remember when Fella, remember I've when had. Fella was on Broadway? Yeah. yeah, I went to see Fella, no lie, six times. R.I.P. Chris Nadler uh, was yes. who worked here at the time. Um, came to me and was like, let's just give away mad tickets. Yes. We were giving away tickets, taking people. Like, it was the most phenomenal Broadway experience that I mean, I've... Fella was so great, too. Yeah. First of all, it was black music. Second of all, it was like, it was a musical that wasn't shitty musical music. Well, it was, it was Bill real T. Jones. Music. It was Bill T. Jones, who is a god, right. period. But keep going. Well, and it's Fella's it political. Yes. It's African. It's yes. Pan-African. It's, it was awesome. It's yes. checking every it box, so live weird. instruments on stage, the dancing, mm -hmm. the spiritual nature of... Uh, just the whole shit. The whole yeah. shit was phenomenal. I mean, and the thing about Broadway and just theater in general, because, like, here's the thing. I might never go back to Broadway again. I might never write a play that has this type of commercial appeal because, like, the kind of plays I'm into are, like, deconstructionist, fucking weird. When you see Slave play, the structure is weird, but it's the closest thing to normal I've written, and that's why it's, like, popped, I think. But the the thing is I have always had a problem with people saying that theater, they want, that they want to engage people of color and young people to see the theater. And, like, their engagement methods are so dumb. They like send out a funny tweet or do something. And it's like, no, you can't engage people you've never invited to a space. And I was like, how can we radically invite black and brown people to this theater? How can we radically invite young people? How can we radically invite poor people? How can we radically invite women? Because you know what's crazy? 70% of the theater audiences are white women. And they aren't even invited to the theater. The marketing is not marketed to them. So I was like, how can we shape our marketing to be inclusive and inviting to black and brown people? Specifically black yeah. Oh, you know, it's ill. Remember I told you I was walking through Central Park with my girlfriend the mm -hmm. other day, and they had a play in the park. So uh, we were walking into Central Park after dinner, and I was like, yo, man, I love Central Park. Sometimes you just bump into people reading Shakespeare, and they're sitting around in a circle reading. You might, We might boom. So I'm like, yo, what's going on over there? A play was going on. So we don't know that it's a play because I've never been to a play, an actual play at that theater in Central Park. Tons of people gathered, 95% white. Yeah. There's a guy on a bullhorn shouting out numbers. Me and my girl walk over near and we're like, yo, that's some weird shit. Everybody's standing around too organized, waiting to win something. What are they actually winning? Black woman walks over to us and just hands us tickets because we're black. The play we went to see was Hercules mm -hmm. in the park, which they were showing, I think it was going on for a couple weeks, where the whole Hercules is black. Jelani the music's Aladdin. changed. The, they got, like, these black women doing, like, a Supremes, like, uh, narrative of the whole play with music. It's a whole different experience. And the, when the lady gave us the tickets, we were like, are you sure? Like, we were taken aback by it. She was straight ahead i'm giving you these tickets because a lot of us don't come to these plays yeah they don't speak to us please go see the play yeah i don't even think she knew who i was that's amazing i mean it's not like she listened to hot 97 or any of that shit she just saw us walking by and maybe she does you guys are like the most listened to radio station and hey, man, also thanks. Thanks. my friends are gonna freak out when they find out that this is actually happening i've told some of them it's on my finsta but like not everyone knows <laughs> it's gonna be crazy <laughs> but the thing for me is that it is about that invitation, that woman coming up to you and inviting you. I told 
every single one of our producers, and they listen. And this is the crazy thing. I have producers that listen. This is the best producing team ever, because who listens to a 30-year-old black boy who's never been on Broadway before about how to get people into the theater? Mm -hmm. No one. And they all are. Like, part of the reason that we're working with the people we're working with on this play is because of radical listening and hard conversations. There have been some fuck yous and some, like, no no fuck yous, no fuck yous. But, like, some, like, <laughs> we will not be doing that right now, Jeremy. Like, right. that you're a playwright, stay over there. But there has, but for the most part, it's been a lot of, like, okay, so, but why? Okay, great, how can we do this? And then we figure it out, you know? And one of the things that was crazy was, like, can we put a primacy on every black voice that's written about this play in the marketing? Can we mm. do that? Just so that, like, subconsciously, you'll be like, Vincent Cunningham, that sounds like a black name, maybe. Like, you know, it might say The New Yorker, but I've seen him on Twitter. Like, and then you see what Vincent says, and you feel differently. You see what Soraya McDonald says from ESPN, who's a black woman, and it hits different. You know, you see what Wesley Morris says, and it just hits different. It's not a bunch of white people being like, go see Slave Play on Broadway. Right, right, right. Because right. that sounds insane. And also, you know... Black, I told them, I was like, if we're going to do a play on Broadway called Slave Play, it ha and our director says this mo much more eloquently than I do, but it has to cost everyone something. It shouldn't be something where we're all out here being like, how can we get all the premium seats sold to the richest white people that can go mm -hmm. come see it? We have to say, no, maybe we will take a loss, but, but we will have that theater full of young people and black people. So let's have, let's have the tickets be as cheap as they can. So they gave 10,000 tickets out for $39. Mm -hmm. Because also, when you invite someone for the first time, you you, you don't ask them to, like, you might ask them to bring a bottle of wine, but you don't ask them to make a whole fucking meal for the, for the dinner you're inviting them to. And asking people to pay $200 for a seat is asking them to make a whole meal. Right. And, the, and the thing is, people are willing to make a whole meal for Beyonce. So it's not, I'm not one of those people who ascribes to the idea that, like, black people can't afford to see a play. And not even that, like, people who are, like, working class can't afford to see a play. Because when I, when I, when I know that when my mom wanted us to go to, to, the, um, to one or two jams as big, like summer jam concert we like saved up our money and she had two tickets for me and her to sit front row in the orchestra and watch like seven different performers we wanted to see that summer yeah people do it for summer jam same mm -hmm. thing it's their one concert they save up for it they organize for it the tickets are expensive but, but the they're point, in there but the point is with yours you're asking them to check out something they've never checked out before exactly and so it's like that they have, 200 dollars yeah. and also something that they've been like historically ostracized from right and no one's ever really made an apology for that i'm here to apologize for my theater the golden theater and one of the ways we we apologize for it was last night when we had 800 black people watching my play that is hard it's not an easy play it's a fucking funny play i heard more laughter last night in that theater than i ever heard in my entire life i felt like the theater was going to blast off into outer space from the laughter and it was like it was like black laughter and I was gonna say, you know? it's because the audience understood on a yeah. different level yeah it was like Hearing that many black people vibing to this crazy fucking play was wild you know and I was like, yeah, this is this is my one one of our one of our small ways of making an apology, you know. And all I've been thinking about is like, how can I get be of service to the community with this play, with this platform? So like, I made this weird website with my friends, like literally separate from the separate from the play, just because I googled what black playwrights have been on Broadway, and when I googled it, it did nothing came up, nothing, and I was like, what the fuck. And then all they said were all the plays that black people had been in, most of which were written by white people, mm -hmm. like Dream Girls, like Color Purple, like all these plays that you think about when you think of like, oh, well, that's a, I saw it with my mom and that's a black play, right? It's like, no, it wasn't. Like literally no black person worked on that. There were no black personnel except for the actors. So mm -hmm. I was like, let me look up the people who have been a black thought leader on, on these stages for since it since its inception. So I made a website called blackworkbroadway.com with like multiple friends. And you can just go on and see, just list it, every black play that's ever been on Broadway by a black writer, a black choreographer, a black musician. And it's so amazing. Because I had people out last night discovering for the first time that since 1991, so like in theater, a lot of revivals happen, right? So they'll take a play that's an old white play generally, and they'll be like, in an old white male play, and be like, hey, like, let's see it again. So there's been like five All My Sons in the last like two decades, because right. people really want to know what Arthur Miller thought about like white men in the 50s. <laughs> there's like, what were they thinking? What can that tell us about today? And, and every time it comes out, either it tells us a lot about today, or it could have told us a lot about today if they had made better choices, but still is relevant to today. And the only plays that, pe that producers on Broadway we have found were relevant about black lives by black writers um, for today since 1991 have only been plays written by Lorraine Hansberry or August Wilson. So mm. 
if you were just a general theater goer, a, a theater lover, even a black theater lover, you might think that as far as black thought leaders go, or even black people who've been on Broadway, the only people that exist are, are, are Lorraine Hansberry and August Wilson. August Wilson. And that's not true. You know, there were so many of us who have made play, the like Zora Neale Hurston's play, Mule Bone with Langston Hughes is the last one, 1991. I want to see that play again. It's their unfinished, wily, crazy play. I want to see the Color Museum again. I want to see Spunk again. I, I mean, I, and these are, and I'm mentioning things from the last 30 years. I haven't gone back to Ain't, Too, um, uh, Ain't Supposed to Die a Natural Death, which was nominated for Best Musical in 1972. Yo, you're way over our head right now. We're sorry. in deep water. Okay, sorry. We, we try. sorry. I'm, 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 I'm looking at these guys. Everyone's, Everyone's like, like uh, uh, uh. I'm sorry. I get up when I start. No, I'm in. I'm learning. I was supposed to be a preacher for five seconds so like i think that now i found my mount on broadway in like a small way but um god damn it well, I'm now, now but i do want to point out i do want to point out <laughs> you are the queer black savior i knew it no but i do want to point out um and i was i've been having this conversation with regard to when daddy o was here from uh stetsasonic the other day and we complain about the lack of knowledge that is shared generationally in hip-hop specifically yeah uh producers how things happen the financing of of chronicling history, right? For certain cultures, the money wasn't put there. The individuals that made money off of it didn't reinvest, yeah. right? In making sure the stories were told and the history was kept. And unless somebody does that and puts money into that the same way other generations and other cultures literally would finance their museums. They would finance their authors. They would finance their plays, whatever it is, to make sure it's there. It's not going to happen because someone else is interested in our story or gives a fuck. Yeah. And that's been a flaw, right? Gen going back generations of, yo, a lot of people made a lot of money. How come nobody invested in making sure these stories were held, uh, told, and everything. So I'm glad that you're doing that, right? Because now individuals who don't know anything about Broadway or didn't feel welcomed in Broadway yeah. spaces have someone like yourself going, yo, here's the story. Here's how the story played out. Here's where the content was created. Here are the people who didn't get credit for it. Here's how great it was. Here's what you should be looking for. You know, yeah. take us through, take yeah, us you on did, the walk. You yeah. did the work. You, yeah. you did take the history. Take us on the journey, yeah. right? Because someone's got to do that work. I mean, and that's what's not invested in. Yeah. I mean, it's just like I, I, so many of my friends were fucking phenomenal musicians, producers mainly. And when I, and I sat under, like at their feet just watching. And like they're, the thing they always went back to is like, if I didn't know this jazz record, I wouldn't make this this beat. If I didn't know this rock record, I wouldn't make this beat. If I didn't know, and, I, and I was always like, Jeremy, you have to know everything. You have to know everything. And like I read and read and read and read. And that's, that was my education as a playwright was reading almost every play that like, that like has mattered to the canon and a lot of the plays that didn't matter to, to the, the canon, canon to the canon the canon the thing that people hold up as like the 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 foundation of american letters and drama i read all of that and all the shit that they threw out of it you know the the adrian kennedy adrian kennedy who's an 89 year old black female playwright experimentalist my favorite playwright mm. lives in virginia emails me which is insane she wrote a play called um funny house of a negro that is probably the play that people know the best and it's just like the most explosive thing ever but I, I've, I've kept that so close to me, and it's so exciting to see other playwrights who do that, like Dominique Morisot, who's one of the only other black playwrights on Broadway right now. Every time she talks, does a speech, she mentions Alice Childress. Alice Childress was supposed to be the first black woman to have a play on Broadway before um, um, L uh, Lorraine Hansberry, but she didn't want to change her play. They like wanted her to change the title of her play. She's like, I'm not gonna change the title of my play. Her play was called Trouble in Mind. And it's one of the best fucking plays I've ever read. And they're like, please change it, then we will produce it. She's like, nope, I'm good. And then it didn't go. Wow. Never went. And then Raising the Sun two years later became the first play. So were you um were you reading all this material and studying um, the history while you were a personal assistant in L.A.? This yes. couldn't have all started once you went to Yale. This goes no. back. Oh, it went way back. So this was your hobby. You were sitting around 
at like at like some event, you know, a meeting with someone you're working for, and while they're sitting in a meeting, you're just sitting there reading plays. Like this yeah. is just what you did. Yeah, and I was talking. I mean, part of the reason I charmed so many people is because like it's a curiosity to be a playwright in L.A. So all these people were like, it's not the place to be. Yeah, you're, you're and a lot of those people used to be old theater lovers. You know, like right. they were like you. They had parents who played show teams. So to have this weird black kid who's over here being like blah 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 blah, and then you know this in 1937 this happened. They were like, what the? Who was that? You know, and it made them really excited when things like my play going off Broadway or my play or my movie getting picked up for them to be like, to call another friend they knew in New York to be like, hey, you should go see this kid's play. When did you become so like obscenely self-aware? You seem very aware of who you are, where you fit in, how people take you. When did, where did that come from? Cause you're 30 years old. Like you, you talking to you seem 55 and like you've been doing this forever, but you haven't, you just got out of school. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm the oldest child of a single mother. I was me and a sister. Um, and I had to, I had to be very self-aware in order to not get in her way, right? You know, cause she had, she worked three jobs and she was making sure that everything was taken care of. So I had to make sure that like my shit was taken care of for her. And she also was really exciting in the sense that she gave me, she let me do therapy when I was 12. You know, cause I asked her if I could do therapy because I was like, I feel like things are going crazy in my head and I'm feeling really sad about things. And I was like, I, <laughs> I watch a lot of TV and TV says therapists are what you do. And she's like, okay, I guess we'll do that. <laughs> Amazing. And so I've been, I've been in therapy since I was 12. So I think that, and then also, I mean, when I was an undergrad, I came to undergrad like feeling like little Nas X. I was like, Ain't nobody telling me nothing. Like, I'm the baddest bitch in the game. I was the best actor in Virginia. I'm going to be the best actor here. All year long in my 52-person 50, acting conservatory, I was always the person that was on people's lips. They were always like, what did you do what Jeremy just did? That was crazy. And this school, the reason I wanted to go there is because they had a cut. Because I was always going to be a lawyer. I was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. But then I started acting, and I loved it. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to be an actor, but I want to go to go to a school that has a cut. So if I'm bad, I'll know. I'll know because I'll get cut. And then I was one of the 26 people that got cut. My name had been on everybody's lips all year. I was cut. And I was like, what the fuck? And people I didn't think deserved to be there got, got to stay. And people I thought really deserved to be there also got cut. And that's when I was like, oh, this whole thing is messed up. Like, this whole thing is about, like, systems that are beyond, like, merit. Like, it's like, you, I can be the best writer in the world, the best actor in the world, but if you aren't work, if you, if you don't have the right foundation set up for yourself so that when, that, when, a, when an earthquake happens, you will crash and break. And I, I did for like three years. And so I built myself back up. And, about, and a lot of that building myself up was by being, by being um, self-disciplined, self-aware, and, and also just like, um, I, I, when every white person that writes for a magazine said that I was the next black whatever, I was literally like, cool, 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 cool. People have said that before about other black people and about me. And like, they moved on and they will move on. Like everyone, like people get, I see people online getting upset that I'm in all these magazines. I'm like, guys, it's going to be over soon. Like, it's really nice that like, you know, people like Will Welch and Anna Wintour and Hanya, uh, Yohanya T Magazine have like invited me into their spaces and have put me in their magazines, but they will put other people in their magazines. There's been a past of soon. the person who's having that moment. Exactly. You're having that moment. And then what happens after that moment? Exactly. With the rest of your life. And I have mentors who I've seen. I One of my mentors was the hottest playwright in the world like, and for a time. And he made three or four three or four decisions that shifted the people's discourse about him. And he's still one of the best playwrights I know. But is he like someone that like when I mention his name at dinner parties, everyone's like, oh, that's who your mentor is? No. And he told me, he was like, when you have your moment, do the thing. Don't ignore the thing. You know, so I got, I, when I was 22, I was getting all these weird lessons. So I think that's why I'm the way I am. I've, I'm 55 because a lot of my friends are 55. Well, I was going to say, I think you, you, you said earlier that one of the great things about your play and the producers is the fact that everyone listens, which is great. And they deserve credit for that. But I just think you deserve credit because we sit here and have to do interviews every day. And I can say that 80% of the time, once the interview starts, none of us feel like listening. And we've all been captivated listening to you for the last 50 minutes. So, like, there's a reason that you're able to motivate a group of producers. You know what I'm saying? I'd be like, all right, this guy knows what Confidence, he's doing. passionate, you know. The uh, knowledge, like just. Well, yeah, and the, and the information well put together. And you have, but the other part of it that, you know, often falls by the wayside and, and people may not know, purpose. You have a purpose, and your purpose isn't just to be popular. It's not you. Yeah. You're you know not saying? the purpose. You're, you're not, you know, it's not about you. It's about you're working on something that's greater than yourself, and you care about it, and you're making sure it's done right, and I think people feel that, and it, you know, it translates. You know, and, and you're also, like he said, self-aware. You know that this is a, a moment in time, 
And what really will define you is what you do after this moment in time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And your ability to stay, uh, you know, active and current and centered. Thank you. And purposeful. I'm so. excited, but I'm, I'm very, and I, so what happened was Carrie, who's helping you with your publicity, was hitting us about the play and trying to get us to go see it. And I'm like, yo, we all want to see this play, but we also want to get you in here. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And get this done. Because I know that we had to get you in here. And now I'm even, I think I'm even more psyched now. We'll have to interview you again now after we've all seen the play. Oh my God, that would be amazing. But um, we're all very excited to see it. Oh so my God. I think we're going to have a team team date next week yeah, and try yeah, to get yeah. Right, and I have joint. no idea what to expect, even oh after God. speaking to you. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I just want to tell people this. It's not, again, it's not easy. It's like a fucking weird. Well, it's titled play. Slave Play. It's titled it's, Slave Play. Yeah. It's inspired by like black exploitation movies and like movies, like movies like Bob and Terrell and Ted, uh, Ted and Alice and also like John Genet, you know, and like Adrian Kennedy. And so, you know, get ready to be inside of some really weird feelings. But I wanted people to sit in a theater and feel. Because so often I sit in a theater with people and they feel dead. They don't feel all the things they feel when you go to a like a because also I've been to so many concerts and I and, I, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on a music place. I've been to so many concerts that I'm like I want to feel all the sort of like amped up crazy shit I feel when I'm at a concert when I'm sitting in a theater because mm -hmm. you can and people don't know that people think that a theater is a chore or something you had to go to like as an apology to someone you know what I mean like it was like it's sort of like oh like it's like it's like oh yeah I guess I should see the August Wilson play they told me to read it in high school and I missed it. Let's go. Or like, oh, Denzel's in that. I'll go see it. You know what I mean? It's like, it's never because people want to sit in singing. a room. I want to be there. Exactly. Right. You know I mean? And I want people to sit in a room and just feel shit. Feel shit in a way that they don't feel in the movies anymore because every movie is a Marvel movie. Or a, re or a remake of a or movie Or a remake of saw. a movie you already knew and have right. fond feelings for. Right, right, you right. Know? Um, Yo, it's been a pleasure, man. Dude, thank you so much. And thank we're going to hopefully have so more of these sit downs, you know, as you go on to do other things. Or like Rosenberg said. After we've all seen yeah, it. Yeah, I'd like to yeah. discuss right? that. Right, because there's going to be this period, right? It's rolling out right now. Everybody's going to see it. And we'd love to have you back and even try to figure out ways to get help get people in the theater on yeah, listen, right, right, when right. that yes. becomes appropriate. Right? That would be have amazing. You, yeah, and have nights where we can have people in there and have the right have the right energy in there, right? Because there's going to be yeah. nights where the energy is, yeah. you know what I mean? I mean, the thing is, my actress came off stage last night and they're like, the tonight was opposite night. They were like, everything that's usually a low with the wipes in the audience was a high. <laughs> everything that was a high with the wipes in the audience was a low tonight. And that means something to them. They were all shaking and crying. And so for me, I was like, oh, this the and also there were black people who'd seen the play both ways and they were like and there was one who was like I'd rather see it with black and white people in the audience like I like that mix feeling both yeah he's things. like I like feeling that energy and someone else was like I can only see this play with a full black audience so you have to do this again you know that's interesting well it sounds like I need to see it with a black audience it sounds like, <laughs> it sounds like I might feel some type of way in there. yeah I mean it's crazy when we had six hundred students in the theater the first moment of the play worked the same way it worked last night. So maybe it's about young people. It's too. aged more than right age too. Yeah, man. Jeremy yeah. O. Harris. Jeremy O. Harris. Slave play on Broadway. Get your and get their tickets right. Yes. Get your tickets. Get your tickets. Yes. yes. Slaveplaybroadway.com.